What is up wrestling fans and trading card collectors? Welcome to another episode of Wrestling With Cards. It's Wrestlemania week. Had to wear the shirt, right? And we're right on the goal line, so to speak, ready to punch the ball into the end zone for this WWE Panini release. I've been saying for a while now, I think 2022, especially with this release and with the Upper Deck AEW release, that this is going to be one of the most exciting times for wrestling cards that I can ever remember. And if we're going to talk about new things and new markets and new products, especially the modern shiny stuff, I had to get Adam Gelman on. Adam runs Sports Cards Uncensored, which you can find in the show notes. I'll have the link to not only his social media feeds, but his website. Adam's got his finger on the pulse for everything modern, not just wrestling. And as we've discussed on some of the past videos throughout the few last few months that I've had new guests on, it's always good to take what's going on in the sports card world, consider it, and then apply that to wrestling because there's a lot of things going on that we just haven't seen in wrestling cards and it's hard for collectors to adapt. And again, we're doing all of this to help you, the viewers of Wrestling With Cards, community members, know where to go for your collections. Giving you ideas what to expect from this kind of new era of wrestling cards that we're coming into. How to approach the release and what it means going forward for not only your collection, but markets and maybe how you can buy and sell things. So I was like, hey, let's get Adam on. He's not been on the channel yet, even though he's been on the Worlds Collide podcast. And when he's been on Tony's show, he's never been on this one. Never a better time to get them on, so that's what we're doing today. But before we get into that interview, just a few reminders of how you, the viewers of the Wrestling With Cards community, can help support my content. You're already here, the easiest thing you can do is hit that subscribe button, give me a like, tell a friend about the show. We've got to keep building the viewer base for this channel, get wrestling cards as a whole out to more people, get more collectors into the hobby. Tell a wrestling fan that's not collecting. Tell somebody that's collecting sports cards but not quite got into wrestling yet. And hey, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today with this Panini release could get them into wrestling cards and then maybe they turn into wrestling fans because they used to be that in the 90s. Make sure to check out the podcast I'm involved with, the World Collide podcast. Myself and Tony Vela from WrestlingTradingCards.com talking all things wrestling cards. You never want to miss that. Come each week with a new episode. Available on all popular podcast platforms. Just search Worlds Collide Wrestling Card Podcast. Probably be able to find it. And if you dig it, please subscribe to that as well and tell somebody about the show. If you would like to help show your support to my content monetarily, there's a few ways you can do that. The best way is Wrestling With Cards on Patreon. Join the Wrestling With Cards community page on Patreon. We're for as little as $1 a month. That's it. $1 a month. You can help show your support and get your name in the credits of these videos. There's also higher tiers where you can get access to exclusive content. Have your voice heard by requesting video topics. There's even a booking committee option where you can come on the show and somewhat steer the direction of the show and some of the videos you see on this channel. You can also check out my eBay store, which is actually branded Beast Bode Collectibles. Long story, maybe we'll talk about that sometime. I'm not going to rebrand that to Wrestling With Cards that I plan. You never know. Never say never in wrestling, right? But I've got all kinds of stuff in there. I've got I've got tons of cheap wrestling and inexpensive ways for people to get into wrestling. I've got tons of dollar fifty shipped cards. I've got some mid-end stuff. I've got, well, you know, four-figure cards in there too, spread out. Nothing too high-end, but just a lot of variety to offer people at what I think are fair prices. So that's another way you can help show your support. Also links below to my social media platforms if you'd like to follow me. Feel free to share this video, tag me in it. Tag a friend, anybody that's got questions on wrestling cards, happy to help as much as I can. And of course, there are links there if you want to buy me a coffee. I actually have one somewhere. I don't know. It's a crazy world, losing coffees. Again, links to everything I've mentioned is in the show notes of this video. Let's go and talk to Adam Gelman. Adam Gelman on the show today. Welcome. Happy to have you. Hey, happy to be here. I love talking shop with guys. It's always my favorite thing to do to get in here and, and really sort of break the things down here. Real quick for anybody who's been living under a rock, which based on the topics that we're talking about today, there are obviously people living under rocks. Give everybody just a brief example of your website and what you do. Yeah, so I run uh, sportscardsuncensored.com and <clears throat> at in, in various points, I'll update wrestling blogs too, but mostly just on Twitter at SC Uncensored and on Instagram at, at WWE Gelman. Um, just sort of detailing my 
clearly uh, insane walk through the wrestling hobby and my Becky Lynch super collection. So there you go. And detailed is exactly what this has been. I've, I've, <laughs> we've talked about this, me and Tony and others, like your work that you're doing with the more modern wrestling stuff and tracking sales and markets and blowing people's minds with things like it's, it's just top notch. And I thought, Hey, if we're going to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in the wrestling card space today, kind of giving uh, people a preview of what to expect, even though you, me, others, we've been warning people what's coming. As soon as we saw the Panini box drop, the price, uh, the uh, little bit of the checklist that we've got so far as like, as far as what's going to be available and pricing and how to approach that. I started grabbing these bits and pieces of people either asking questions, complaining. And I was like, hey, let's get Adam on. He's the one that's been working on this. Let's talk about it. So let's start with, and you can throw your own personal take into this, but we're going to try, oh, to, take, try to take this whole show from uh, just kind of information for you guys out there watching this that are going to be buying these products. So let's start with your initial impression of the design and just kind of the checklist that Panini's starting with. So I, I think that that's a really interesting conversation overall because, like, I, I mean, like, for, for those that aren't familiar with my history, like, Panini and I don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, yeah. and that's putting it lightly. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, like, when you think about the way that they design their products, like, Prism and Select to a degree as well, and a lot of the Spectra, I mean, they're all based on Topps Chrome type configurations, right? So if you think of Prism as Topps Chrome and you think of Select as Topps Finest, you think Spectra as Bowman Sterling, like there are clear delineations that they built these products around because they recognize that Topps was able to accomplish market dominance in a lot of these areas prior to their coming into the hobby. So when Prism was brought onto the, the scene in 2012 with football, like they were like fledgling people trying to figure this out. Like they, their designs were awful. Like, even though they're iconic cards now, I still don't find them that attractive at yeah. all. But like you, you can see like once they hit their stride, which was about 2014, 2015, like things just took off. And it's because they started to adopt a very clear approach that collectors can build expectations around which is like they're going to have a border they're going to have full bleed action shots leading into the border they're going to have a lot of specific um, configurations that include a lot of color and a lot of refractor type things they call them prism whatever um, and it's all built around one thing and that is loyalty this brand and tops chrome as well yeah. And all of the other chromium stock products are built around one thing, and that's loyalty. Because when I was growing up, this product was my my jam. It still is. Like, I still love Topps Chrome. I ripped a ton of it for WWE. I've ripped a ton of it for football, all of those things. So when you think about the design of wrestling this year, it's based on the designs they're putting in all of their prison products, which I think is a really, really good thing. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of the gigantic borders. Usually they're much smaller. But overall, I mean, like, it's pretty standard prism set stuff. Now, when you get into, like, the champions and, like, some of the other inserts they designed specifically for WWE, they did a tremendous job. So, I mean, like, again, I'm not a Panini fan at all. Like, a lot of reasons beyond just design. Yeah. But, like, they, they did a pretty good job here. I, I will say that. Yeah, the I mean, the color blast, we knew kind of what it was going to be like. They didn't change yeah. much for that. The gold inserts, I really like those, the that from what i've seen you're not the only one yeah, yeah. I, I think like i think that that's where a lot of collectors are sort of gravitating towards is like they know what to expect here and that's why we're able to predict so much of what is going on. one thing i saw as a huge backlash and i think probably both of us kind of laugh at this is uh panini doesn't understand the wrestling car collectors we want autographs and ink we don't want a million parallels and my immediate thought was like okay but you understand these are probably going to be sticker autographs, which a lot of people frown upon. But also, if you look at some of the top selling cards, no matter what genre it's in, they're parallels. They're not autographs. You want to speak to that a little bit? So let's let's just get this out on, on the forefront of this here right now. Everybody who is currently in the wrestling card community has said some variation of what you just said. Some variation. Yeah. Panini doesn't do this, or why are they doing that, or blah, blah, blah. They don't understand us. You are not the target market, period, yeah. end of story, okay? Like the target market for a Prism product is not the people that currently exist within the wrestling hobby. 
Now, I've said this probably on five or six of these podcasts, yours before, Tony's before. Like, I just had another one with Tony a couple of nights ago. Like, wrestling collectors need to understand you are a small niche hobby. We are a small niche hobby because I'm a part of it too. Right. Same. We are a small niche hobby. We have very few people. We have tiny little Facebook groups that mean literally nothing in the grand scheme of things. Yep. Should it be like that? Probably not. Right. We want to right. be able to operate within the hobby that we've come to be so passionate about. And I've spent, and I'm not exaggerating, I've spent weeks worth of work document and this is actual man hours not just like a time frame but i'm like mm-hmm. actual man hours weeks worth of man hours documenting participating in collecting within the wrestling hobby guess what i don't mean a thing like i am a little tiny speck in an ocean of people that right. are going to be coming specifically just because it's prism now how that translates into the later products which aren't prism select will probably have a little bit of crossover because it's still chrome type stock but when you get into like the WWE specific products that they have been contracted to build, that's where I think it's, it's going to be a lot different and we'll truly see the impact. here. We'll get to impact here in a second, but overall people just need to get over the fact that they were important and they're not anymore. And that is a really tough pill to swallow for a lot of people because it's so personal for so many of us, because you know, back in 2017, when I first started doing wrestling after moving away from the rest of the sports industry, stupidly, because I lost a lot of money <laughs> there. Um, I recognized something in the wrestling community that doesn't exist anywhere else in the hobby. They, for a lot of the wrestling community, it was very tight knit because the human nature sort of explains to us that we should group with similar like-minded individuals. For us, that was a really small group of people. So when you think about it like that, it's understandable why people are so passionate about these things now versus what we saw in 2020 when it all happened in the baseball, basketball, and and NFL. You know, that piece of it is so frustrating for so many people, and it creates bitterness. Bitterness because it's personal, and it shows that people are passionate about these things for a reason. That's not saying that Panini doesn't understand It's that they don't care and they shouldn't because they've built their brands around very specific tenants and those tenants will continue to exist, whether I exist, you exist, or anybody exists, because they are driving towards a very uncertain future, right? We know in Mm -hmm. 2026, they will lose all of their valuable IP in the NFL and NBA. They will lose access to MLB players association so even the local list products they won't be able to produce anymore the only thing left that they will have is ncaa potentially hockey if they get it ufc and wwe there are other things like soccer and premier league that they can still produce cards for but it's more of an international audience and some of them haven't been very successful there's also nascar which is like the tiniest of the tiny niche hobbies so i mean like they have assets but not the most important ones anymore And so when you think about how to, as a business, approach this, right? Because that's what card companies are. They're businesses. They're not in the business of making friends. They're in the business of making cards. And so they have to really strike while the iron's hot. And guess what? The iron is as hot as it has ever been in the 100 plus year history of this hobby. So why would they do the things that they're doing as a business? I would do those things. I'm sure you would too. Same, yeah. But that's another thing with the wrestling card hobby compared to sports cards. A lot of them don't understand business. So like, no, I don't, I don't say that. I wouldn't say that, but I would say, I would say that unlike the other sports where there is a ton of crossover, right? NBA collectors collect NFL, collect baseball more often than that. Sure. Yeah. At least some aspect of it. Wrestling people live in a bubble. And I, maybe that's, maybe that's what I meant. And I just (laughs) didn't word it correctly. Yeah, Yeah. And like wrestling collectors live in a bubble because for a long time, it was easy to live in the bubble and sort of ignore the outside world. So when we get into these conversations, I just got into a giant fight with people on Facebook over this and I shouldn't have, <laughs> I was just bored. Um, a lot of them just don't understand that this, all of this has already happened and happened at a greater scale than they could ever imagine. And they just are willfully ignorant. And I wish I could be too in some cases, but they're willfully ignorant of the challenges that they are going to face entering into a new era with Panini. And that's not Panini's fault necessarily because they set a price and then it's another price by the distributors and another price and reorders and all those other things, which we'll get to, I'm sure in a second. But like 
more importantly, like Panini has a business model and it's a very predictable business model. And I was telling Tony a couple of nights ago, and I'm sure it'll be posted here in a couple of days or whatever. We are at the, we're at a tipping point here. And it's a tipping point that we saw coming eight months out. Mm -hmm. So if you were listening to people like me who have been screaming this, like I haven't been shy with my, like I've literally screamed. You you shouldn't be. The information you're providing is like exactly what the people in the bubble need to hear, whether they like it or not. Right. So when you think about it, like, Basically, I've been screaming this from the rooftops. You should invest in this. You should invest in this so that when all of this comes, you'll have the money to build equity enough to afford a lot of the things that you want to afford. Some people took that to heart and probably like me made a ton of money. Like right now, what's going on, which we'll talk about here. Like I've I've been on your podcast. I've been on the world's collide. I've been on all these. I've said exactly this. Right. And I've I've kept up with uh with a couple of the people that we've spoken to, and they've really taken that to heart even more than me because they have more funds available. Right. I'm still very much not available because I spend all my money on Becky Lynch. Yeah. Right? Yep. So I think the the challenge is like even with a small amount of capital, I mean very small amount of capital, I was able to run away with a a, t- a huge haul that I've right. used now to to fund other things I'm doing in the hobby, which I'm sure you'll see on Twitter here in about a week and a half. Right. So I think like, <clears throat> it's not prism related, it's WrestleMania right. related. Yeah. So like, uh, like you have to understand, like, if you played this right and you saw the formula the Panini has used, it shouldn't be a surprise. None of this is a surprise. Right. And to be bitter about that just seems disingenuous and weird. Like, I, like I get the passion, like I get the understanding of why it's so problematic for people. But it's like we've known about this for eight months. Like, she should, like I get the initial shock, but shouldn't we be past that by now? <laughs> Speaking of initial shock, that's the next point I want to talk about. We saw the box prices drop. We saw that MSRP 150, and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, we can do it now." And then we saw the first pre-orders drop at like seven, and then they've gone up since then, and people are outraged. Mm-hmm. So, what's your first impressions of the box prices and the reaction that people had? Uh, great question. Um, the box price should be higher. I'm completely and hundred percent serious about that. We are lucky that it's at this time, it's still available at $800. It's a thousand dollars too cheap. And the reason I say that is because a year from now, we're going to look back and think, man, I wish I should have bought that at $800. I wish I had $800 to spend on this. I know. Right. But so the thing here is that if you look at the market, it supports a price like this. If not, I would say it supports a price that's double this, likely yeah. in the long, in the grand scheme here, because for a couple of reasons, and again, these are like hour long conversations in themselves, <laughs> yeah. but I'm going to try and boil it down. Like the way that Panini prices things is they have a cost, right? So just like if you went to Costco and you bought a, a bottle of ketchup, Costco got it at a lesser price than what they're charging you as the consumer. So And Costco is a wholesaler, so they also have built-in membership costs and all these other things. Now, let's say you went and bought that ketchup at another place that didn't have any of those things, right? This is basic economics, right? I have to get it from a supplier, and the supplier has to make money. The manufacturer has to make money. And now the end retailer has to make money. So the price points are going to be different, right? So that was one of the feedback is like, why is all these prices different? Well, aren't they doing this? Well, here's how it works. Panini has an MSRP at 150. That is likely, see, this might have changed because I haven't been involved in this part of it for a long time. But let's say, for example, that that is the price that Panini actually expected people to sell it at, okay? okay. So let's just, and that may not be true here. So just bear with me here. So if they are expecting a dealer or an end retailer to sell it at 150 bucks, that means that those people paid less than 150 for that box. I don't think that's the case, but we'll, we'll for the sake of argument, yeah. let's say it is. So then what Panini does is a couple of, well, we can do this from the tops and Panini because they approach it differently or they used to at least. Panini will send out their solicitation like they did a couple of weeks ago and they start accepting pre-orders. And really what those pre-orders are not public pre-orders, they are allocation requests from different dealers like blowout cards like your local card shop breakers all of those things that all want a piece of this product and they all allocate that product based on probably a few shady business practices but let's <laughs> yeah. say it's all equal let's say for instance that it's equal 
the people that buy the most product from them over the course of a calendar year will get a larger allocation of that product than a retailer that doesn't. So if you only buy from them a box or two here and there for your card shop, you do not have the same access that somebody who orders 30 cases of National Treasures every year, right? Or even more than that, the crappy products. So like the the flux and like the, the mid-range products that go mm-hmm. nowhere. If you order a ton of those, then you have better allocation situations here. As a result, you're going to buy it at a price and you're going to know that the market can support a larger price because we know for a fact that Prism Firsts go for a ton of money. Right? Absolutely. So, so what they do is they're going to say, realistically, what is the highest price I can get away with, right? And mostly it's set by three people. It's set by blowout cards, it's set by DA card world, and it's sometimes you know, by some of the distributors like Peach State or Southern Hobby or something like that. So for, for them, if they say, it's 800 bucks. Guess what? Everybody's putting it at 800 bucks. Yeah. And it's not because they feel like they need that to recoup their costs. It's because they're a business and they can, the market can support it. Right. So that's why those prices were what they were. And a lot of people aren't educated enough on the goings on of a hobby when the industry is really what's supporting it. And the industry is built on this type of situation. Now let's look at tops because tops does it a little bit differently. Tops still has some allocation built into the way that they distribute products, but they, they used to, I don't know if they do anymore because of the boom of trading cards over the last couple of years, but they used to print to order. So if you had, uh, they would solicit products six to eight months ahead of time, sometimes like okay. just giant runways of time. And they take all of those pre-orders and they sort of adjust their product run to match the pre-order plus a little bit, right? If it's a larger product that everybody's going to want, they, they adjust it a lot. If it's a smaller product, they probably adjust it a little bit less. I don't, this isn't me actually like experiencing this. This is just what I've heard from other Right, parts. yeah. And then for the most part, they'll distribute those based on pre-orders as much as they can support it. Sometimes products go insane like they do with product prospect products and baseball and stuff like that. The allocations don't show up, but you know, there's still that aspect of like, how do we support our best customers first? And it creates this access problem. Fanatics has already said in taking over tops and taking over part, a large portion of this market that they're going to try and reimagine that. I don't know what that looks like. We saw it a little bit with Gary V's product. Right, the, but, yeah, the uh, V friends. Yeah, but overall, like this is the way it's been done for decades. So when you look at a $900 box of Prism, you're like, this is supposed to be 150 bucks. I will tell you this. If you are a person that says, why is it 150 bucks? I will. I would love for somebody to post an allocation at 150 bucks and see what happens to their website. Oh yeah. They will, yeah. it'll, it'll explode because there are like the guarantee that you will pull a $150 card in that box is almost guaranteed. Like it's, there's so many cards in this product that are insanely valuable. The odds that you recoup $150 in value is cl- as close to a hundred percent as it's ever been with a yeah. person product, right? So how do you account for that? Well, you have to take basic economics and there's, there's a very small supply and a huge demand that's growing by the day. How do you work with that, right? So what do you think the, what's your reaction to the wrestling card uh, collector's reaction to that? Because it wasn't, you know, it's typically like with sports cards, uh, a lot of people are like, all right, no problem. I'll just buy into some breaks. But it seems like the reaction has just been, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm getting out of the hobby now. Do you think that's, again, just living in the bubble? Yes, to a degree. But there's things that they're not considering. First, um, Prism comes probably in five to six different flavors. The hobby configuration is the most expensive, right? So if yeah. you think about, I'm going to buy a hobby box of Prism. That is the most expensive that it can be, okay? Then you have something like an H2, which is like a Prism Lite, which is like, it doesn't have all the content that the hobby does, but it has enough to make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the hybrid, which is usually a combination of the two, which is like a mid-range product. Like this, the demand for this is so high that they have to create, they can, they they don't have to, but they can create all of these different market variations Mm -hmm. that allow them to sell the same cards 
over and over and over and over and over again, right? And right. there's enough demand right now, there's enough demand to support that. There's also a retail configuration and there's going to be three or four different retail configurations. There's also going to be breakers like Layton or others, uh, you know, Platinum, whoever, who will be ripping Prism in a format that they've never been able to do with a WWE product before. Now, Layton is probably a little bit of a weird example because they do a lot of WWE stuff, but like we're talking about breakers that have no experience with WWE for the first time ever wanting to get involved in that. So there's going to be like for somebody like me who collects a single person and a lot of wrestling collectors are like that. There's going to be options where you can buy into an entire case worth of cards, but not have to pay for anything, but you're one person. Yeah. So instead of paying $9,500 for a case of prison, you instead can purchase just Becky Lynch and you'll get all the cards from her and, or you'll purchase Alexa bliss. Or you, now there will be vast price range differences between a King Corbin and, you know, Roman Reigns sure. who will yeah. probably be one of the top people, but you will have access to those things for the first time ever, ever. They've never happened before. You can, they did that for Transcendent a little bit where you could buy in the slot or whatever here and there. And there are some other breakers like Hardsmiths who I use all the time. They do a lot of WWE stuff and have built a business of people around that. But we're talking about every breaker on the planet trying to get in on this. And that's, and we're talking about Loop. We're talking about whatnot. We're talking about all these different platforms, Mm -hmm. all offering access to prison. It's not going to be cheap. It will be cheaper than buying a hobby box. So that and one other thing like that's one product right they're probably going to produce six to seven of them including two ones that have never been seen before so at least two so when you're talking about like i don't have access to prism yeah you might not have access to one set but the chance that we get to another set like whatever the first wwe specific product is you'll probably have a lot of access it won't be this cheap as you know top flagship at 40 bucks a box but it won't be 800. So, I mean, there's, there will be more like immaculate will probably be more than prison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would think. Case. So, and there's a high end product too coming. It's not going to be national treasures from what I understand. It could be, it's not going to be flawless from what I understand. It could be like, I've heard a lot of rumblings, but like overall there will be a high end WWE product because we've seen what transcendent the market can support it. Yes. Those boxes will be more expensive than prison. So, it used to be that WWE collectors had access to everything because everything was cheap. Right. And everything was cheap. It was awesome and fun. And that's why people are so upset. But there's still going to be access, just not to everything. Right. So people just have to adjust their expectations. And we'll jump into that on the next question. But one other thing before we leave this topic, this is actually yeah. something I've seen in the sports card world. Uh, a couple of podcasts that are really popular and, you know, social media accounts have said, yeah, WWE's got this Prism stuff coming out, but it's going to be a fad. It's just going to be like all these other things that people have jumped in. What's your take on that? Uh, lol. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so that's a. I, I've seen that a lot too, and that's one of my favorite. <laughs> that's one of my favorite reactions. It's like, oh, this isn't going to stick. Like, it's going to stick. Yeah. And I know it's going to stick because it's stuck everywhere else. And people will say, well, it's it's not. It, NASCAR didn't stick baseball draft picks didn't stick baseball didn't. I'm like, there are specific reasons why that didn't happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can point to them very easily. And I have on Twitter a lot, the difference with WWE and even the difference between WWE and UFC, because that's the most commonly Mm -hmm. compared sort of situation. Sure. UFC kind of took everybody by surprise as F1 did on the top side. Right. So when you have racing cards that are selling for $150,000, like that's a shock because F1 never had that level of following. What people didn't understand is that from an international perspective, there's people with yachts that buy these cards, right? So Mm -hmm. on the UFC side, it similarly took people by storm because for a long time, the Topps products were very much the way wrestling products were, very undervalued. So when they launched a Prism brand and you're starting to see Conor McGregor gold Prisms going for five figures, all of a sudden people are like, what the hell is going on here? And they go back and they go buy all the other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So with WWE, it's different because as we will get to talk to you in a second, like the trajectory is already like this, not like this. And like, you're seeing things happen on a daily, hourly sometimes basis. that have never happened in wrestling cards before. That's just insane to me. Um, And I talked about this with Tony, like 
you know, we are literally watching a lightning bolt strike a barrel of money. Like that's basically what's happening here. And you, as people watching these podcasts and watching these videos or listening to these podcasts, watching these videos, like you've been clued in for eight months. Like that's something that your parents never had, a, like going to buy Apple before it explodes. Like right. no yeah. one bought that stuff. Like, right, you know, like, those people are billionaires now, not millionaires, they're billionaires. Now that's a different scale here. But for the first time, this is something as a generation in this hobby that we've never been able to predict like this before. It's literally been like a guarantee. And if you played your cards right, and I did to a degree, and I'm sure others have too, more so than me, you probably have made a ton of money in this ramp and this ramp will continue unlike it did in UFC. Now there's a lot of contributing factors why that happened. And some of it is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? All of those people that went through the UFC sort of upswing sort of are starting to say, "Uh Oh, let's compare notes a little bit and go back and do things differently with WWE because they saw what happened with UFC. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole different set of circumstances for something like NASCAR, which launched like two or three years ago and is pretty much in the toilet right now. WNBA, same thing, huge launch, but sort of fizzled out. UFC is still kind of going strong. I mean, but again, we're going to see the same thing with, with WWE year over year. It's hobby loves first. So when you have an initial go, whether it's MetaZoo or UFC, as I was just talking about, or Gary V's product, like whatever it might, NFTs related mm -hmm. drops, stuff like that. People want to be in on the ground floor and that FOMO will, fear of missing out, will drive them to buy things they wouldn't normally buy. Prism, because it has a track record and a history, is like a sure thing. Why wouldn't you buy? If you have the money, like I know people who do have the money and have bought, already bought like five to six cases of this at huge prices because they know what's going to happen. Right. It's a, it's not a, it's not a predictor. It's a spoiler, right? Like this is what is going to happen and it's going to continue. Now, whether it continues into year two, I mean, I think it's a law of diminishing returns because it's not a first anymore, mm -hmm. but there's a trajectory here that shows that wrestling and NASCAR to a degree as well, but wrestling right now is probably the most, undervalued portion of the hobby that exists and the reason i say that is because i can buy the most expensive modern wrestling card for like 15 grand like I, if i wanted to and i had the money i could go and acquire the top modern wrestling card for a fraction of what a base level card is in some of these other hobbies right so when you yep. look at nba and nfl if I want to buy a base level investment piece for Justin Herbert, it's going to cost 15 grand at least yeah. base, not the, not the, not the top level. This is like the, the lowest rung on the ladder. And you're telling me that this can be like, you can change the entire market with a hundred grand. Like if I went and got 20 people together and we all put in five grand, like we could change this market. We could literally yeah. tip over a bunch of dominoes and things would explode because that is the that's how small the wrestling hobby is right now, both in terms of print run, supply, demand, and all these other things. Like, doesn't it has never existed like this ever? And it's crazy because it takes a, such a small amount of money to go in and just blow everything up. And people have done that already. Like, there are people who are going in and doing that on purpose because they know how little how little amount of money it takes to really change things. So we've talked about that and the price point on the boxes and introduction. We've kind of covered the, the intro stuff for Prism. How, if, how would you or advise people to approach buying this product? Buy it if you can. I mean, like that's like anything and everything you can buy. Like, I mean, are Shinsuke Nakamura cards going to all of a sudden be worth 20 grand? Probably not. But like, if you have access to pricing that is at a level below what the market is, is dictating th this, there's, it's literally like the, the easiest thing to make money on. If that's your thing, mm -hmm. if you're an investor and you're trying to get into this, you're already ahead of the party just because it hasn't released yet. Like most people don't show up till the releases. And so like, if you get it at a great price, buy the hell out of it. But if, if you're looking to get in at the top level, right? So we're talking Roman Reigns, The Rock, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin, like those guys, 
it's going to take a lot of money, a lot of money to do that more so than it ever has in the history of the, of the wrestling hobby. And we're looking at like, okay, if I have a PSA 10 Hogan all-stars 82, like that's a five figure card easy, right? Like that's yeah, easy. maybe a, that's maybe a six figure card, depending mm-hmm. on how many of them there are. And I don't, I don't like the people that engage with those cards as people, but they have, built a market for this sometimes through manipulation and other things that i'm talking about doing with modern cards right now because the market was so small you can manipulate it really easily so like when you think about okay do i invest here here or here the answer is yes because it's it's, there's just like let me put it to you this way lewis hamilton's um card for his rookie card or whatever it was sold for 135 thousand dollars or whatever it was Mm -hmm internationally lewis hamilton is like michael jackson right like he's yeah. a really important person is there somebody in wrestling who has that level of celebrity you're damn right there is yeah several. <laughs> like <laughs> several like the rock is the biggest movie star in the world like he may not be the best movie star in the world but he's the biggest yeah. right he is everywhere and everybody wants him and he's gonna be in every movie right he has cards in this set right he has cards in this set and he'll have cards in every set. He still hasn't signed a card since 1998 or whenever Comic Images came out. Mm-hmm. So if Panini can bring stuff like that to this license, it's a game changer, right? Right. Are we saying that Lewis Hamilton internationally is more famous than The Rock? Maybe, depending on what country you go to. Sure. But I'll tell you, Lewis Hamilton's cards right now are like 5X with The Rock. Is he five times more famous than The Rock? I don't no, think so. not in the grand scheme. So team. like... All right. So like, that's what I'm saying is like, is he five times more famous than Roman Reigns? Probably. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that there isn't growth that can be had in that space. Is he five times more famous than Stone Cold Steve Austin? Steve, Steve Austin? I don't think so. Yeah. But again, if his cards and, and Stone Cold is even less than The Rock. So when you're talking about like the discrepancy in value across this industry, it's enormous. It's absolutely insane that these are that undervalued just because it's fake fighting right that's how everybody looks at it yeah men running around in tights we can't touch that exactly so there's a lot of really weird things at play here in terms of why they're not valuable but there's one thing that they have just in absurdly beneficial situation and that's there's just not a lot of them and like so when you look at like the ticket market and you look at like things that are just genuinely in short supply, not artificially in short supply, but genuinely in short mm-hmm. supply, wrestling cards fall into that. There's just never was a lot of them. If you look at 2014 Chrome where everything is exploding, mm-hmm. like these things are that way because the print run was like 250 cases, like no Chrome product ever has been that small. And now you have like a, a what was it's like a wave of people all trying to buy it. Good luck. Like, yeah. There's just not a lot of it. So we're not talking about artificial scarcity now, serially numbering things and stuff like that. We're talking about genuine scarcity, which rarely exists in this hobby anymore. So then you look at Prism, which is not going to be scarce. It's going to be printed to the moon because they should. Does that change the investment potential? And the answer is no, because it's still in comparison to the general hobby. It's like a fraction. It's like the the most expensive card is still not even going to touch even a base level investment piece. Yep. And even if, so, if I pull the black finite prism or whatever they call the one on ones in prism of the rock, let's say, like, let's say just like in, a, in the most positive, optimistic situation, it's a hundred thousand dollar card. Sure. It's not, but let's say it is. How many basketball cards released every year are over a hundred thousand dollars? Several. In the hundreds. Yeah. It's in the hundreds, right? <laughs> like, Drake is in here busting cases of flawless, just trying to chase five of them, right? So, I mean, there are products that have multiple hundred thousand dollar cards in them from an NBA perspective. NFL, like, there's been multiple hundred thousand dollar cards available in recent products. And you're telling me that wrestling at, at its highest level doesn't touch that? That's crazy, right? Because it's the, the 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 correlation of value considering that wwe is a billion social media followers and i'm literally not exaggerating that they right. do have a billion social media followers internationally but there's a huge international market for wwe all of these things are contributing factors so then you add in like all these other contextual things like 
how is this not the biggest win in the history of the hobby, right? But it's yeah. not because of all that stigma that goes along with it. Then you're then you're like, okay, is the hobby going to be able to support itself long term? And that is the question that everybody should be asking. Is like, will if the hobby does suffer, and it already has seen some of that bubble deflating, like if the hobby does suffer, does that mean that? wrestling cards are going to suffer and i would argue it's probably one of the first things that will suffer because it's such a small niche like nba and nfl will be the last things to suffer yeah but wrestling will definitely be one of the first so the next question i had kind of transitioning into a collector perspective a lot of people you've seen it i've seen it saying i'm priced out i'm just going to get out of the hobby and that's not what we want at all We've been trying to give you guys the warning on this to kind of just like you've said, you know, game plan. What are you going to do? How are you going to collect? How are you going to spend? So for those people out there that are saying, I can't buy into breaks, I can't buy these cases, but we want them to stay with the hobby if they're having fun. What? How would you propose to them, whether it's going back to buy an old product or buying singles once this stuff breaks, how would you go going forward? How do you think they should approach collecting? Um, well, I think you're like people just have this general misconception that everything is going to be valuable it won't right like it, like if you collect the rock or roman reigns you're probably already priced out if you like me and you collect becky lynch or charlotte flair or sasha banks you will be priced out but if you collect like you know trent seven like or somebody like that like his cards will be very affordable Mm-hmm. Like you can, like, if you have to study the way that the sports have reacted to the boom, right? So Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, like Steph Curry, like all those players just skyrocketing in value. But like the bit player bench guy, like he doesn't, his cards are still a dollar, right? So, I mean, like there's tent poles that support this big circus tent. And like, if you're staying away from those poles, it's, it's going to be very easy to operate buying singles, you will not be able to buy wax. Just put it out of your mind. But if you want to continue to collect your guy, whether that's Xavier Woods or you yeah. know the you know Dana Brooke, like who who knows? Like name a person that isn't on the top two or three tiers of this hobby. Like your life isn't going to change much. You just won't be able to buy wax. Yeah, one thing I've been trying to encourage people with this release, and I'm I'm like, guys, Panini does a million parallels. This is like a super collector, player collector's dream. And I'm trying to encourage more people, like attach. Hold you know, on, it, hold on. It's not. So we we shouldn't approach it that way. It's not a player's collector's dream because every one of those parallels gets more and more and more and more expensive in value. Like that's, that's what drives that's what drives this product. Now, as you get into other products, absolutely. But like Prism we should like rainbow chasing for 99.999% of this hobby is going to be out of the question. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess that, that, I guess that's what excites me as I'm, you know, I, obviously I'm doing the cross stuff, but I'm still looking for super fractors that are, you know, I think priced way higher than they should be. And it's still a chase for me. And I think that's fun. And so, like, I like to chase that kind of, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're the same way with Becky. Like it's fun to chase after that instead of chasing wax, a, you know, a chase in the wax, if that makes sense. Yeah, you brought, it's a, it's a good point. I mean, but, like, but again, like me, you said, maybe people don't want to spend that kind of money on that. And, and so just to give it, like, I talk a big game about like pricing people out because like, I, I may have presented myself as like, I'm out too. Like you have to understand, like my days chasing being a super collector is over when prism launches and that's fine with it. like i came to terms with that months and months ago like it's just part of the thing like tops even probably pitched that to wwe is like you're gonna be <laughs> getting rid of all these people now to the wwe that may, might matter but to the general grand scheme of business it means very little yeah. to nothing so i mean like for me it's like yeah i get it like a lot of people are gonna be priced out but like the the chase doesn't stop like i mean you just may be at the back of the line rather than the front of the yeah. line and you know again this is one product of many like people need to get it out of their head that every product is going to be like that because it won't be like that we've seen that with ufc mm-hmm. and like you have to be able to differentiate your experience in prism from everything else select to a degree as well but like you're talking about like there are going to be products you will not participate in because they're just too expensive. Panini is not built to, around super collectors. Tops was built around super collectors because it was easy. It was accessible to everybody at a low price. And you could chase 
anything you wanted because the most it was going to cost you was like 500 bucks, right? So that the products were built to support that. So like you have to understand there's a reason why Tops flagship and like the base product, Chrome and all those things have are built the way that they are in WWE is because they know how people collect here. I've advised them on that, right? Mm-hmm. That I've sent them those, those understanding. They read my stuff. And like, so I'm not saying that they've completely just shifted everything because of what I've said, but they understand that I represent a very big part of that market and has probably changed some of the ways they've approached some of these high-end products. That's why Transcendent is what it is, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's built to create that chase where similar to what they had in Panini, which they were trying to capitalize on for a long time. But other products like... Um, Money in the Bank from two years ago, which is probably the worst product Tops yeah, ever built. Yeah, it's pretty right? bad. <laughs> or, yeah, like even that product was built to support the super collectors because there's just like the rainbow chase in WWE was always the goal for so many people. It's unlike any other hobby, right? I, when I was in football and I collected a lot of football cards, you can go on my Instagram page and see how much money I lost selling them <laughs> off too early. <clears throat> like at, when you're in football, you buy one, you get the best parallel that you can find and that's it. Like you just move on. And I'm adapting that now to wrestling because I know that Panini fosters that environment more than they do the super collecting. And that's fine. Yeah, like that's yeah. just a different business model. And collectors need to adjust their understanding and expectations as well. So you're talking about like, if I'm going into an immaculate break, trying to say, okay, which Becky Lynch cards do I want to collect? I'm going to be lucky to get one, right? right? I used to be able to say, I can get all of them. Right. I used to like going into Undisputed. I think I need four cards left in the entire product. Like in Panini, that'll never happen. It just can. It's too expensive. It's there's too much sprawl. Right. Because with Tops, a very small group of people were breaking it. So you knew that if a one on one was going to be pulled or a low number card was going to be pulled, it's probably in this group of people and they're easy to access and they're all in the Facebook groups. Panini, that doesn't exist because they're going to be everywhere. It's going to explode as we were really tough to find the the pieces of the rainbow that you were able to find cheaply and accessibly in the previous products. I think something you said as far as grabbing that one piece, I think that's a great way to collect too. That's kind of what I'm doing outside of the super collection or my like all-stars autograph set that I'm trying to put together. Me too, yeah. Outside of that, I'm like, hey, you know, like, okay, I like Roman, I like Hogan, uh, you know, Charlotte, what, just pick a name. And I'm like, I'll go after, I'll get one big card and call it good. Like, I think that's a really good way to approach things. Right. So like this card, I don't know if you can see it because of the blur on my screen, but like yep. I bought the, the, the triple autograph, right? The Roman yep. Reigns bloodline triple autograph. And I bought it for a pretty high price. Like it's more than I've spent on a non-Becky collection card in a long time. Um, I'm not buying all of them. I'm just buying one. Yeah. Of them. I don't need more of that card. It's not my super collection. So like, I think my shift will be more towards adopting that across my entire collection, which is right. It's sad. Like I put weeks and weeks <laughs> into this, like hours of the night and yeah. like talking to somebody in France to get a one-on-one. Right. So like right. getting a translator to somebody, like those are the things I've gone through to get cards and pieces for my collection. Like it's, it's a really bittersweet pill to have to swallow. Right. Because you know that all of those cards you just put so much work into are now more valuable, but to get more of those cards is going to probably be something you can't do. Anymore. So the, and I said this on Tony's conversation as well. It was like for a lot of these collectors on the WWE side, they are only in WWE. So if they sell everything off to fund the WWE collection, that's it. They're done. They're done in the mm-hmm. hobby. They, they right. have no ability to re-enter other places um, unless they decide to start over. And they may say like, okay, I'm done with tops. I'm moving on to Panini. People will do that. But for a lot of those collectors, they only have wrestling. They only know wrestling. And the money that they would lose um, or the, the money that they would make selling their cards would mean that they would lose all of those access and that stranglehold they have on whatever collection they, yeah. they collect. And it would be impossible for them to re-enter anywhere else except for into the Panini products, which they're now selling off their prize possessions to afford. So I get why it's like, why the bitterness is there. I just, I think it's, it's, just like trying to like face down a, a Godzilla type monster. And you're like, 
I'm just going to start throwing rocks at it. Like that's right. not going to help. Like, you know, like there's nothing you can do to accept like harbor that bitterness and it just eats at you. It's not fun. Yeah. But I, again, I think your approach that we both can agree on, I think it's still just a great way to keep going and keep having fun with whatever you like to collect and not break the bank, sell a little bit of your collection. Doesn't mean you have to get rid of everything, but maybe not chase everything. I don't know this. I just think there's a lot of different <laughs> ways to approach this that you can still have a lot of fun with and sell and make some money and just keep going as opposed to just throwing up your hands and saying, I'm done. Yeah. I think the, like for me personally, it's like, I want to, like, I'm going to have a lot of fun just watching this. Yeah. Like, like, the, like it's become a spectator sport. And it's like, right. like I'm, I'm, I'm constantly like checking updates on the, there's a Roman Reigns super factor from finest. And it's currently up and I've been posting a lot about it's not so it's like, it's <laughs> jump. It's like jumping like hundreds of dollars at a time. And it's just, fun to watch i'm not bitter right i'm not putting my money into it but like you know like it's just like to watch that is it's fun like that piece of it it, and cheering others on who are much more able to support their wealth gaps than you are like that's what this hobby has become about and that's why the social media influencers have really sort of got the hold that they have is because things have gotten so expensive and things have gotten so inaccessible that a lot of the collectors are sort of living vicariously through these influencer personalities. And I think that's going to happen here too. So the last question I had, this is a little bit different than anything else we've talked about is the digital aspect that Panini could bring. And then tying that also in with WWE's Moonsault NFT platform. I know Mm -hmm. you dabble a little bit in digital, so you, you get it. And one thing I want to say before we kick this off is I was completely shocked at the, like, I'll just say most of 2021, how the wrestling card community latched onto the Top Slam app. And they were actually paying money for this. And then I was like, you know what? If Panini does this, they're going to have legitimate blockchain cards. Or if WWE does their own NFT platform, if to my surprise, if the wrestling card community actually latches onto these things, these could be as big as the cards if they keep that reaction the same way that they did with the Top Slam. What do you think on that? And what do you think we could see as far as Panini and digital going forward? There's going to be a heavy, heavy contingent. Like we already know this. So then it's like, okay, what does it look like? And I think that there's a couple of different potential directions, right? There's the Moonsault platform, which is likely not going to be card related. It's probably going to be NFTs based on moments or something like Top Shot, where it's like a, a moment in time, which the WWE is built on, or it'll be superstar related stuff which I'm excited to see. Like, I yeah. think that, and they could tie it to experiences like they have in the past with the Undertaker ones. So like, there's a lot of potential in that platform, a lot of potential, but I don't know if like it's the NFT market is in the same place that it was, you know, a year and a half ago. There are yeah. some aspects of it that are even higher, but a lot of other aspects of sort of like the fad has kind of like died out, yep. which I get. Everyone's like, well, you just talked about how the fad isn't, no, this is different. Um, but let's say, for example, like Panini has an app for Dunk and Blitz, which are like Slam, right? They're mm-hmm. digital cards. They're not NFTs. They're just like, it's a digital trading card platform. So if the app goes away, the cards go away. NFTs are a tad bit different because it's like a digital receipt for a picture that you know exists on a server and you have rights to that specific server piece, right? So it's not like you own the rights to the picture. It's like you have a collectible... Um, version of that picture right Mm -hmm. and those are tied to the blockchain which is much different than any of the apps are set up so will panini launch tops or a a version of top slam i i'm not sure because they didn't do it for ufc yet um so they may be moving away from that and i think they should because nfts are much more impactful than that ever could be Um, So I'm guessing they're probably going to move more into the NFT platform. Now, here is where things get a little bit dicey. Prism NFL just dropped like last week or this Mm -hmm. week. And it didn't do very well. Like they sold a lot of packs, but the individual single cards aren't selling the way that they should be. Right. So if you think about this from like, if I pull a Trevor Lawrence Prism card in the real world, it's worth X amount of dollars in the, nft world it's worth like a fraction of that because for whatever reason people just didn't buy into panini's platform panini opted to hold it on their own platform which i think hurt considerably and there was probably a little bit of blowback from what happened with tops as nfts which have completely gone off the rails so like i mean i just don't think the nft market for cards specifically 
are, are really going the direction they need to go. Um, and I would say probably best to let that one play out on its own. I'll probably buy a little bit. Moonsault is a little bit different because it's probably not as much card related going to be stuff. Um, more just WWE NFTs. But the NFT market as a whole, I think, is kind of tapering off in the, at the at the fringes, right? So like the, the core things, like the monkeys and whatever, yeah. like those things are still worth an insane amount of money. But and, and it's not, and that's actual money. That's and then through Ethereum and whatever. This is kind of like fringe NFT stuff that's built on Panini's platform that isn't wide ranging. And you know, there are a few big supporters of it, like Instagram. Spinatron is a very big supporter of Panini's NFT platform, but. Like I bought a few of them just to see what it was like. And I just, I wasn't that impressed. Like, I think it's like the platform is as limiting as anything. So I think from a perspective of like, is Panini going to build a top slam? The answer is probably not. Will they build NFTs? They might, depending on what rights they have from WBE to do that. But I don't know how successful it will be. You feel any safer about the Moonsault platform as it being tied directly with WWE is more of like not necessarily a rug pull like we've seen with a lot of these other companies that have come out with stuff? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think there's more potential on a rug pull from the WWE side than there is from the Panini side. Because Panini has built this because they've woven this into so many different products. But I think the potential for value is probably higher on the WWE side because they're promoting it directly through the mass the massive social media Mm -hmm. juggernaut that they have available so i i just i don't know man it's it's that's one investment platform around sports that just other than top shot just really hasn't taken off and top shot has even calmed down quite a bit as well so i mean like it's still worth a lot of money if you have the right stuff but right man like i i like panini wwe nfts like prism cards and whatever like I mean, if they charge a, a dollar a pack, maybe where you can get some nice stuff. But like, I, I, I only brought pack, the, like, I brought this up because I was shocked people were spending money on the tops thing, and I'm like, you, you like, you know, they they, and then one day it disappears, and people are like, we're, you know, like they, there's, I, I know you're paying for entertainment, yeah. but yeah, that's a little bit different because the the tops apps aren't NFTs, like it's a right. platform, right? You pay the platform's gone, the cards are gone. The NFTs are like if the server still exists with those photos on there or those image files on there, then the NFT will be there mm -hmm. forever until those servers are shut down, which hopefully won't be something that people are running into. Some yeah. have already, but like I think from a Panini standpoint, like they've made an investment in their blockchain that I think is much less vulnerable to a rug pull than the WWE and their Moonsault platform, which hasn't gotten off the ground and may not get off the ground. So that's yeah, it's supposed to be launching by uh, this by the time this airs, be WrestleMania week, and uh, hopefully it'll be out by then. But we'll see. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not getting into that. I, I I love the idea and I'll dabble if it's if it's affordable enough, but not enough to like really dive in like I did with Tops. Well, Adam, thanks thanks for coming on and uh, spewing all of this fantastic information <laughs> in you know audio and video this time instead of just in text, which is where we're mostly following you on Twitter. Speaking of that, yeah. let everybody know once again where they can find you and anything else you want to plug. Yeah, it's at sc uncensored at uh, on twitter so like you can just follow me on twitter um, my instagram again is wwe gelman that's g-e-l-l-m-a-n um basically a chronicle of my becky lynch super collection and then uh, my blog is www.sportscardsuncensored.com so. i'll make sure to put links to all of that in the show notes so everybody can check it out so thanks again for coming on thank you guys for watching thank you yeah, no, this is great. Thanks. Thanks, Adam, again, for coming on the show and giving us his time. And for a while now, me, Adam, and a few others have been trying to, I guess, warn or talk to the wrestling car community, because we care about it, about this new era that we're coming into with wrestling cars. New companies coming in with Upper Deck and Panini. New eyeballs coming in with this Panini release, mainly with a lot of the non-traditional wrestling card fans coming into the space. Whether that's just to flip the product or whether they are actually wrestling card collectors and they're like, I know Prism from sports. Prism wrestling, I can get into. Maybe that's the kind of approach they're taking. I don't know. But it's just, there's more eyeballs coming into it. It's facts. Look at what all the super fractors and shiny stuff selling for now. I hope today's discussion with Adam brought you some value and will help you going forward into 2022 with this new release and the way that you buy, sell, and collect wrestling cards. Hopefully many of you stay with us in the wrestling card space. A lot of you have said, I'm priced out. 
A lot of you said, I'm not paying these prices. I can't even find the products. If I can't just go to the store, I'm not buying it. A lot of you said, well, you know, I want to stay in the hobby. Prices are high. I'm going to work that much harder to get what I want. And then some of you have said, I don't care what's coming out. I'm still collecting stuff from the 80s. And all that's fine. The whole point of this content, this video, this channel, is to just give different perspectives to help you kind of think outside the box, change your mindset, maybe maybe not change your mindset, and just stick with what you're doing. But all of the stuff we've talked about is not to try to run anybody out of the hobby. It's just, again, some information to know about. So when something hits you, and you know we've talked about this over and over again, when those box prices came out with Panini, me, Adam, others were like, hey, it's gonna be high, it's gonna be high. And people are like, oh, it can't be that high comes out at seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a box and people are like, oh, this is nuts. I'm like, well, we tried to tell you guys. And that's the whole point of all the content that I do is to just get awareness out there and hopefully help somebody and bring some value. Again, make sure to check out everything Adam is up to. We'll have links below in the show notes to his social platforms as well as his website that is just a plethora of information specifically when it comes to modern wrestling cards. And while you're there, check out the links to all the stuff I'm involved with. The Worlds Collide podcast, ways you can help contribute with Patreon and the eBay store and social platforms, much more down there. So before you click off this video, check the show notes, open that up in a new tab, whatever you got to do to check it out. And then when you're done with that, if you've paused this video, you can click the videos on the screen for even more great wrestling car content. Thanks for watching. We'll see you there. <laughs>